Good day, everyone. Thanks for, for turning up. So I know it's the last session of the day and it's getting uh, late in the week. And um, yeah, you've probably all been to a bunch of sessions on exciting things like HTML5 and Windows Phone. And um, it seems like that um, application lifecycle management on Windows Azure is maybe not quite up there with the cool factor. Um, I guess to that I'll say, look, Windows Azure is cool. Hopefully you all know that. Hopefully you've all had a chance to, um, to play around and kind of understand the, 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 the value and, the, um, and just how much time it can save. Um, but while ALM may not sound cool, I would say that there's nothing less cool than having projects that are late or buggy or inconsistent or unreliable. So um, ALM is really, I guess, your, um, your recipe to stop being in an extremely uncool place. So let's be excited. Let's um, think that, yeah, it's not a, not a drab topic. It's actually a, a, a pretty, pretty important and um, hopefully somewhat interesting topic as well. Um, so my name's Tom Hollander. I am an architect um, in Microsoft Australia, currently working in Sydney. Um, I've done a bunch of, of different things in Microsoft, including spending a few years in Redmond with the Patterns and Practices team. Um, but for the last, um, last year or so, I've been working pretty well exclusively on Windows Azure projects. Um, a lot of it working um, with our technology adoption program, so helping sort of early adopter customers um, living on the bleeding edge kind of get these projects um, successful. So um, what we'll be talking about today, first I'll give you a bit of an introduction on, on ALM and also talk a little bit about um, some fundamental ALM concepts and how they might apply and how they might be different for Windows Azure projects. Um, but for most of the talk, we'll be talking about sort of specific parts of, of ALM that are of most interest to Windows Azure. So these you can see on the screen here, so build, deployment, uh, testing and operations. So let's dive in. So, okay, so what's ALM for a start? So for a long time, we used to talk about SDLC or Solution Development Lifecycle. Um, that was fun for a few years, and then after a while, the acronym got a bit stale, so we needed a brand shiny new one, uh, which is ALM. But ALM is, is really supposed to be, I guess, a bit more all-encompassing than SDLC. So SDLC, I guess, is about the things that the development team does, so um, the different processes that take place during um, the, the development phase of the project. While ALM looks a little bit more holistically, um, looks at um, some things that might happen before the project starts, um, so some of the requirements analysis, um, parts of it, the application, uh, it also might look beyond the um, development phase, so actually looking at some of the uh, operations and management aspects of it. Um, and as I said, ALM is important because it's not really possible to make good software without good ALM. Uh, good ALM doesn't guarantee good software. You can still make some crappy software if you do a bunch of things wrong. But ALM is really, I guess, the hygiene about how to run a development team, um, how to make sure that things are done properly, consistently, reliably. So when we look at Windows Azure, how does it change ALM? Well, the good news is it fundamentally doesn't change that much. So a lot of the things, well, at least all, all of the, the, the big, big picture sort of boxes that you need to tick are all still there. You still need to think about governance. You still need to think about requirements analysis and specification. You still need to do development design testing, all that kind of stuff. Some of, because you know you're targeting the cloud, there might be some things which, yeah, you'll do a little bit differently. So um, probably a lot of you have been to some architecture sessions about Windows Azure and you've learnt about um, sort of how to choose between Windows Azure Storage or SQL Azure or how to um, scale out and things like that that might be a little bit different. So while the output is different, the actual job of being an architect and the process of architecture, I would say, is really not particularly different. And so it's similar to development and other things. So yeah, you might not write the exact same code, but sort of what it means to develop is not sort of fundamentally different. So the areas that I've highlighted here are the ones which are most impacted. So build, testing, deployment, and operations. And really, one, the, the biggest reason why a lot of these things are different is that you can actually do a lot more. The cloud is always there. It's on the internet. It's in a predictable place. There's predictable APIs uh, for doing things like build and deployment. So while a lot of things that you might, when you're targeting a, um, an application on-premises, for example, yeah, you've got you to build it, you've got to deploy it, but there's probably a zillion different ways, and no two projects are going to do it the same way, because one might... Um, it's a funny noise. Um, one might um, require an MSI, and one might require a PowerShell script or whatever. But yeah, the cloud is kind of a known quantity, so it's actually, uh, you have a lot of opportunities to do a lot more. Um, however, at the current time, so when you've played with Windows Azure, if you're just getting started or you've seen a bunch of demos, you've probably seen the Visual Studio tools for Windows Azure, and they're pretty good, pretty exciting. You can go and build an application and right-click and publish, and it's in the cloud in, in 15 minutes on a good day. Um, and that's all done. Um, 
and the, the situation we are right now is the tools were really optimised towards the single developer um, demos really well. But if you haven't started work on a, an actual team, we've got developers with testers and architects and project managers and all these different people. Um, you, you'll, if, once you start doing that, you will find that sometimes it's not really obvious. Um, look, how do I make my tools? How do I make Visual Studio? How do I make TFS? Do this stuff that I need to do, that I'm used to being able to do on-premises and suddenly it's all different. So the reason we're having this talk today, I guess, is to um, show you that, well, number one, the tools are not fully mature and that it's not always obvious how to do that. Um, but on the other hand, um, the tools are very flexible and very customizable. And I've worked on a, a number of different projects where we've actually been able to get a very large amount of automation, a lot of predictability. So it um, takes a little bit of effort. Hopefully that effort will go down over the next um, sort of year or two. Um, but right now there's definitely no excuse um, not to have a, a really solid um, ALM process for your Windows Azure applications. So um, some of the things that we'll be talking about today, um, I guess, in, in each of these areas. So build, we'll talk about compiling, configuration management and packaging, so it's ready to go to the cloud. Um, for deployment, we'll talk about actually how to get it up in the cloud, installed, and actually verify that it was deployed successfully. We'll talk about a few different kinds of, of testing and how testing might be a little bit different for um, cloud applications. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about operations. And again, operations is um, quite different for the cloud, so it's important that you think about, um, about what that looks like. Before we go into each of those things, though, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about um, environments. So environments is a term that we probably all use all the time whenever we're um, doing software, software development. And exactly what they mean will probably vary from project to project, but you'll have the development environment and the test environment and the UAT environment and the staging environment and the production environment, for example. And that probably means a bunch of servers. So the test environment might be a couple of servers sitting under someone's desk. Um, the UAT environment might be in one data center and the staging and production in a different data center and you kind of know sort of the processes and actually what physical machines you're talking about. Um, and there'll probably be quite significant differences in, in actual, actually what the hardware is. So the development server is probably going to be whatever you found lying around in the average team, while the production will probably be some nice fancy new blades. Windows is yours interesting because um, everything is the same. So um, every single Windows Azure server, no matter what you use it for, is basically the same specification. So Windows Azure doesn't know or care um, what you're using things for. So um, tests and staging and production and everything, they all cost the same, they all behave the same, they all have the same performance characteristics. Um, but you still need to actually think about these concepts um, from an ALM perspective. Um, to make things more complicated though, um, Windows Azure has its own sort of set of terminology, including things like staging and production slots and things like that. So, um, when, so before you can, um, I guess, start a meaningful discussion about environments, uh, let's kind of look at the abstractions that Windows Azure provides and actually what they all mean. So at the very top level, we have a billing account. So everything in Windows Azure is ultimately needs to be um, charged back to somebody. So the sort of the very first thing that gets set up when you build a Windows Azure subscription is you've got to know, okay, who's going to pay? Um, and this is an important concept because in a typical organisation, uh, probably a different part of the organisation will pay for development of applications versus uh, run, running of production applications. So actually thinking about who's supposed to pay for this is a really important decision to make. So within a billing account, you can have multiple subscriptions. And in Windows Azure, a subscription is ultimately a management um, uh, border. So within a subscription, you can have one or more Windows Live IDs. Um, but basically, everyone that's got access to that subscription can do absolutely everything. So they can scale up your instances, they can shut down your deployment, they can deploy new certificates, they can do all sorts of things. So when thinking about environments, think about who should have access to this and are there different um, sort of groups that need to have power in different areas and we'll set up different subscriptions for them. So inside a subscription, you can set up uh, what we call services or managed services sometimes. And a service typically is the actual application that you're building. Um, so it's um, a collection of, of roles and service accounts and things like that, of, of storage accounts. Um, but that, that actually is the application. But the application has two different slots um, um, that we call um, deployment slots. And this is where it gets very confusing because they're called production and staging. And every single service and every, um, has those two slots. So one that you might use for quick and dirty testing still got something called production and something called staging. 
um, as does the one that your real users are connecting to. So don't confuse the production and the staging slots with a production and a staging environment because they mean completely different things. The purpose of the production and the staging slots um, is simply to allow you to deploy new versions of your application uh, while minimizing or eliminating downtime. So the production slot always has the URL that you chose, so foo.cloudapp.net, while the staging slot always has a URL that you didn't choose, which is a gooid.cloudapp.net. So normally what will happen if you have a, a version of the application deployed in, in foo.cloudapp.net, uh, you'll deploy the new release to staging, which will have some GUID. You'll test that it works as expected. Then you'll flip the two around, flip the virtual IP addresses, and then you'll delete the new staging environment, which is the old production environment, or, or slot, I should say. So it, it's a really useful feature, um, but don't ever get the notion of production and staging as slots confused with the notion of environments. Um, within each deployment, we have a number of roles, and roles are fundamentally units of scaling. So a role is a, a template for a particular a virtual machine. And then finally, within um, each role, we actually have our running virtual machine instances. So um, some of that might have been a bit of, of revision, but it is important that you kind of think these things through from an ALM perspective. Um, and the reason it's important is um, when you actually set up a real-life project, and it's going to go through all these life cycle phases and you'll be doing testing, you'll have different users doing it. Um, you want to get this right early on. You don't want to sort of set every, everyone running in the same account and then make it really difficult to migrate later. So what I've got here is not the only answer. It is a, um, a well thought out answer for a particular organisation. Um, you will have different requirements, but what I want to discuss here, I guess, is just some of the main thought processes you might want to go through. So in this organisation, um, as I mentioned, is, is very common. Um, a different department is going to pay for development of applications versus of running of production applications. So in this case, they've actually set up two different billing accounts that are charged back to different parts of the organisation. Um, the development um, part of the organisation, of course, has a bunch of different people with different roles and responsibilities. Um, and some of those roles are developers and testers. And as I'm sure you all know, developers don't trust testers and testers don't trust developers. So therefore, we're going to get some different subscriptions uh, for these guys. But I guess more, um, more fairly, um, they've just got different needs. So developers want the ability of just try stuff out, do random debugging, um, do some prototyping. Um, they want sort of flexibility to go to make changes without anybody telling them that they can't. Um, so in this particular case, they're setting up maybe a couple of different sandbox services for trying out different things. And they're free to do that whenever they want. Test team, however, likes to be a lot more methodical. And in this case, they have one service that they're using for maybe a daily build uh, where, they be at, where they can do testing with their automated test suite every day. Uh, whereas they have another service, which might be for user acceptance testing, which is maybe just the build from a previous iteration or something which has an, a known sort of set of features that an external group wants to test. Um, and again, the testers want to be able to sort of control this and not have any developers um, accidentally delete things or whatever. So that's why we've set up different, subscri different um, subscriptions for these purposes. Um, then meanwhile, back in the, um, in, in the operations subscription, um, here we're actually only going to have one managed service, which is for the particular application that's in production. Um, and as I mentioned, we always have two slots. Whether we like it or not, there's exactly two, and they're always called staging and production. Um, and it's a bit hard to see on the diagram, but the intent here is that the staging slot is empty 99% of the time. So we're only using the staging slot basically as a, as a part of our deployment process to go and temporarily test that it's working before flipping it over, then we'll delete it. So the production slots are the ones we actually keep running for, for any length of time. So hopefully that's given you a good context to set up uh, to think about environments and how you might want to set up um, your various Windows Azure thingamies um, in the context of a real life application. Is there a question? Can you put the UAT environment in the staging slot? Oh, look, you could, um, but it's, it's generally because you don't get control over the URLs of staging slots, um, it's, um, it, it's, a bit, um, it's a bit awkward to deal with sometimes. Um, and also the other problem is if you did do that, then you don't have the ability of doing a, a, a no downtime deployment. So a staging slot's no cheaper than a production slot. It costs the exact same amount. So generally, it's actually best if you, if you have different audiences wanting to do different things, just set up more services. It doesn't cost you any more and you get more flexibility. So staging, you should normally think about literally as a staging for this imminent deployment for this particular service, for this particular audience, not use it for a completely different purpose. 
Okay, so let's, um, let's talk about build. Um, and build and deployment is sort of closely interlinked, so I will jump um, back and forth um, a little bit here. But I guess as a, a big picture before we kind of go into details, um, here is sort of the, the high level view of how a typical team um, environment would be set up. So every developer has their own computer, which has Visual Studio, of course, um, and it will have the Windows Azure SDK and the compute emulator and the storage emulator for that matter as well. So all day, every day, developers are writing code, press F5, run it, see if it works, all that kind of stuff. They can do that without getting in each other's way, so that's all goodness. Um, when they finish the feature, they will then go and check it into their source control repository. Might be Team Foundation Server, might be something else, um, but they'll go and check that thing in. Um, that will probably run continuous integration, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then at a predictable interval, and typically once a day is what an Agile team would do, um, you'll have a build server which will pull all of the latest code from your source control repository, um, do a much more compiling and packaging, and then it will be able to do a deployment to a particular Windows Azure environment. And ideally, that same build server will actually be able to deploy to uh, multiple, uh, multiple um, Windows Azure environments with potentially different configuration settings, um, but without any manual intervention. So that's the kind of big picture of, of how we're going to look at it, and also how we're going to divide up the concepts of build and deployment. So continuous integration is something which um, hopefully um, most teams do because it's a really great way of, um, I guess, minimising the possibility that a developer's check-in has broken a bunch of stuff. Um, so continuous integration normally just consists of compiling and running unit tests. And unit tests really by definition are about testing the functionality of individual classes and methods. And um, you generally want to stub or mock out all your dependencies. Um, so because of that, um, unit tests for a Windows Azure project really shouldn't have any particular Windows Azure stuff in them. So even if you are using Windows Azure APIs from a unit test perspective, uh, those th dependencies should all be mocked out. So you shouldn't need to install um, the compute emulator or um, even the Windows Azure SDK as long as you set up your, your, your continuous integration uh, unit test properly. So basically CI should just be something that can run within your test runner no fancy dependencies, no fancy processes. Should be just what you do already in any other project. Daily build, though, is another thing. So we'll talk in more detail a bit later on. Um, but I strongly advise that you should be deploying to the cloud um, at least once a day. Um, so the more often you deploy to the cloud, then the more predictable your processes are going to be in terms of actually reliably deploying. Uh, but also means you're able to test against a real environment, not something that's not quite real. Um, test absolutely every day. So um, a, a daily build is, again, is what most Agile teams would do. You might do it at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. It's up to you. Um, but ultimately, what that will involve is everything CI involves. So we uh, compile and we run our unit tests. But then we'll actually also want to deploy this thing to the cloud. So that will require a few things. We'll have to modify our configuration so it actually targets our, our environment, that, um, that they are presumably our, our test environment. Um, we'll have to package it in a format which is suitable for deploying, and then we'll go through the deployment steps, and I'll go through all of this in a lot more detail. But let's talk a bit about the tools of the trade. So as I said, um, the experience for an individual developer running just Visual Studio and the Azure SDK is, is really good, but it's a single user experience, and it's not suitable for, for a team project. Um, so the, the big difference is all the magic happens on a build server, um, and build servers just work in, in different ways and have to do different things. So um, I've worked with uh, quite a few customers um, in setting up build processes, and this is kind of the main tools that, um, that, that people end up using. So MS Build um, is kind of the build engine that comes with Visual Studio. Even if you're not using TFS, you can still use MS Build as a command line um, utility. And there's some uh, targets, um, as they're called, which are basically a series of, of, in, of almost a recipe of how to build things that come with the Azure SDK that really help with the process of packaging and, and updating configuration. So, um, yeah, there's a few different ways that you, you, you have to kind of create some MS Build scripts that say exactly how you want to leverage these targets. Um, but yeah, MS Build is your friend and is likely to be a critical part of your build process. If you are using Team Foundation Server, you can go a little bit further if you want and have a more streamlined, more flexible experience. So anyone that's a, a build master or, um, or got one on, on your team, 
uh, may have played with a XAML workflow-y thing where you can actually be really precise about exactly sort of what steps you want to do as part of your build process. And a complicated application will have quite complicated build that will update version numbers and label things and do all sorts of fancy stuff. So it is definitely, um, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, useful um, to, uh, to integrate some of these as your capabilities within the context of um, a much larger build process and TFS will give you some fancy things you can do there. Um, the other key uh, ingredient or, or um, tool of the trade here is PowerShell and that's particularly for deployment. So um, deployment actually consists of quite a few steps and PowerShell is by far the more, most practical way of actually getting your packages to the cloud and I'll show you some sample scripts in um, just a few moments. So um, configuration management. So this is not a new problem. Really, almost any interesting application uh, will have configuration settings, and those configuration settings will typically vary depending on the environment to which that application is deployed. So connection strings are the most obvious example, but there are a bunch of other ones. Um, so um, you might have a bunch of application settings where you just need to put different numbers in for, for test and production, for example. Um, Windows Azure has its own really specific configuration settings that are often need to vary um, across environments. So the size of instances is interesting if you want to minimise your cost in, in dev and test environments. The number of instances is another key factor. Um, things like your SSL certificate names are likely to be different and maybe URLs of other systems that you're integrating with. So there'll be a whole bunch of things that are, that are going to be different. Um, you absolutely want to automate this. Um, if you rely on manual processes, number one is you'll forget what the settings need to be in each environment and the guy that knows that is going to be sick today and you're going to have a lot of, um, a lot of problems. Um, and also you'll forget to do it. So you'll deploy an application probably to production and you'll accidentally leave the development connection string and then you'll panic for three hours while we're trying to figure out what went wrong. So automate all of this stuff and test regularly. Uh, if it's part of your daily build, um, then your final production release will be a complete anti-climax as you've done it 400 times before. So or you definitely want to automate all of this stuff and have all of the different uh, settings for each environment in some kind of change control or configuration management database. So there's more than one way of solving that problem. You could put them in TFS, uh, possibly set ACLs on the settings so that the developers don't have access to production connection strings and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of ways you want to do it, but be, well, a lot of ways you could do it, uh, but you definitely want to automate that as much as possible. So as I said, it's not a new problem, and people have probably come up with all sorts of weird and wonderful ways of addressing this in the past. Um, but Windows Azure does, um, I guess, have created an extra level of complexity um, because as well as the web.config file, which all web applications have, and, and Windows Azure and web applications still have it, Windows Azure has its own special configuration file. So it's got the service configuration file, which is sort of the dynamic configuration for your application, and it's got the service definition file, which is kind of the static uh, configuration. So in a typical application, you will have settings in all three of those files, or at least two of those files, that need to change. So just because it's a Windows Azure application doesn't change the fact that ASP.NET and WCF and everything like to store all of their settings in web.config. So you'll still probably have a bunch of settings that you need to transform in web.config. Um, and then if there are Azure specific things that you either deliberately chose to store in service configuration um, or um, maybe Windows Azure already has it, like the number of instances, you'll need to transform those things as well. Another key thing to understand is how transforming configuration needs to be done relating to packaging. So a Windows Azure package um, application is packaged in a file with a .cspkg extension, which is basically an encrypted zip file, for want of a better word. And that contains the service definition file and your web.config and all of your binaries and files for your project. So any um, transformation of configuration in those files needs to be done before you package. Service configuration, on the other hand, is separate to the package and can change whenever you want. So conceivably, you could go and, and transform that configuration whenever you felt like it. But as I said, in a typical application, we'll probably want to transform multiple files, so it kind of makes sense to do, um, do all these things at the same time. Okay, how do you do it? Um, so Visual Studio 2010 has a really nice feature for web.config files. So if you load a new web project, you'll see you have uh, web.config, and under that you'll have web.debug.config and web.release.config. And that's really cool because the base web.config is kind of the default settings. And then these other ones have just got deltas. So you can just say, add this attribute or change this, this element or whatever. So you don't need to change very much at all. So that's a really cool, set, cool, cool feature. And you can absolutely use that for your, 
uh, web.config and Windows Azure projects. The bad news is that out of the box that doesn't work for the other config file types. Um, the good news is that there is an MS build target called transform XML, which you can use pretty easily to actually make that work for any file that you want. So one thing that I've done um, on projects is actually use that same syntax with the deltas for all three files and get the build process to respect those. So that's, that's one thing you can do. Yeah, question? Oh, cool. Yeah, so just for those um, on the recording to the, the point here is that there's a NuGet package that which will sort of automate getting that set up for your service configuration file. Yeah, um, there are a couple of other options. So there's a brand new release of the Windows Azure um, tools for Visual Studio that has a different way of managing multiple configuration files uh, for service configuration only. So it doesn't work with deltas. You just have a, a service configuration.cloud.cs CFG and the service configuration at local.cscfg. Um, that's brand new. Uh, it works fine um, and it's integrated with a tooling but it is different to the other tools which is a bit annoying and it also doesn't work for service definition. Um, the other thing is a lot of the customers I've worked with have had their own versions, own ways of managing configuration whether it's based on token substitution with regexes or um, XSLT. Um, they're all fine as well so if you have something that already, that already works feel free to leverage that. Um, but in any event, you'll need to solve this problem not just for one file, but probably for three, and make sure that you uh, you integrate it at the right phase of your um, build process. So, um, so great, we've compiled our application. We've now modified our, our configuration. So the next step is building this package file. So again, if you use Visual Studio as a single developer, you just right click and say publish, and you never even see this package file. It exists, but you never see it. Um, What's happening under the covers is there is a um, console application called CSPack, which basically takes all of these files and, and creates this encrypted CSPKG file. Um, so if you want, you can call CSPack yourself. Um, and depending on what your build process does, that may be the right thing to do. Um, but generally, an easier thing to do is to use the MS build target. So there's an MS build target called Core Publish. It's very badly named because it doesn't publish anything. Um, all it does is package. Um, but, but core publish is basically a wrapper over the CSPack command line tool and it's very easy to integrate with your, C with your MS build scripts and I'll show you a sa sample later on um, and basically without having to write any fancy code uh, you can go and invoke as part of your build process the, um, the process of creating this package. Um, a couple of, of gotchas that you can run into here. Um, first one is um, a very common problem for um, people building Windows Azure applications. Um, we've all heard the it works on my machine thing um, and that of course happens for Windows Azure applications, but one common root cause is on your development machine you may have assemblies in the GAC that do not exist in uh, Windows Azure. So what will happen then is um, you'll compile your application, it runs fine locally, um, the reference will not be set to copy local, so when, it, when the, it gets built on the build server and compiled into the CS package file, uh, those reference assemblies won't be there. Um, and then when you deploy to the cloud, things won't work. Happens all the time with App Fabric Service Bus. Despite being a Windows Azure feature, it's actually not installed on the Windows Azure VMs by default. So it's kind of crazy, but um, whenever you're dealing with things that are not going to be gapped on those Windows Azure boxes, just make sure that you select that reference, choose copy local, and make sure that when the thing gets packaged, um, it will include all of those DLLs uh, locally rather than relying on them in the GAC. Another, and th that can be a problem even, even on a single developer machine. This, um, another problem that is really quite unique to building on a build server is if you have multiple websites within a single role. Uh, that's a really cool feature. It means that you um, don't need to have lots of instances just because you've got a couple of different websites. Um, the way you do that is you set up in your service definition file multiple sites and um, the sort of secondary sites are configured with a relative path name relative to the primary site. So I almost guarantee what will happen is if you use this feature and it works fine on your development machine, once you set up your automated build process, you'll find that nothing works properly because the relative path that's fine on your development machine is not pointing to the correct place on the build server. Because that's because MS Build likes to put files in a, in, in a very particular way and that relative path will actually point to the uncompiled version of your secondary websites. So when it gets packaged, you'll get your ASPX files and everything, but you'll get no bin directory and then you will deploy that to the cloud and it won't work. So um, there's, there's a blog post um, on, on my blog um, that, that talks about how to address that. Um, but ultimately you'll have to, 
either copy everything as part of your build process to the right location or possibly transform your service definition file so the relative path name used on the build server actually relates to the um, compiled version of the application, not the uncompiled version. Okay, so by now we should have um, a nicely built package that contains um, unit tested code, compiled code, and configuration that's for a particular environment. So the next thing we want to do is deploy this to the cloud. So um, ideally what we want to have is a single process that can deploy to more than one environment. Um, so we don't want to kind of hard code parameters that are specific to an environment such as the, um, the management certificate and subscription ID and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we want to do a whole bunch of, of different things. So I'll, I'll show you in a minute what they are. The way that pretty well everyone that's attempted this problem ends up solving it is using PowerShell. So ultimately, deployment consists of a few kind of low-level operations, deploying certificates, deploying packages, modifying configuration files, flipping uh, virtual IP addresses. That's all exposed with the, through the Windows Azure management API. And yeah, theoretically, you can call that a whole bunch of ways. Um, but um, if you want to sort of script things, it's pretty hard to call REST calls from any kind of scripting languages. So if it's something you have to, it's a separate download, but it's called the um, Windows Azure PowerShell Commandlets. And that gives you really standard PowerShell syntax uh, for um, doing uh, Windows Azure service management operations. Um, all this API requires a certificate for authentication. Um, so that certificate you manage through the Windows Azure portal. Um, so you'll need to remember to deploy that management certificate to your build server and also make sure that whatever account is running your build under has uh, permissions to that private key. Otherwise, you get all sorts of weird authentication um, errors. Um, but once you do that, you basically get quite a lot of flexibility in your PowerShell script to um, do all sorts of different things. So as I said, deployment sounds, in, sounds simple, but um, for a large application, there's probably quite a lot of code because you want to do quite a lot of different things. So um, what I'm listing here is the kinds of things that um, I've seen customers do uh, when deploying applications. So it's not just a, a one-step thing. Um, so a service is not just the package. It will have certificates almost certainly. If you're doing anything with SSL, if you're doing anything with remote desktop, if you're doing anything with WCF, you'll probably have certificates. So you'll want a controlled way of publishing those certificates. So that's a, a separate step. Um, we've got to go and upload that package. Um, we want to deploy it. Um, we probably want to integrate some smoke testing. So ping some URLs, see if you get 200 responses, or maybe actually do some automated UI tests. Um, as I mentioned, you should always deploy to the staging slot if you care about downtime. Uh, then you can do some testing against staging, and then once you know it's good, you can flip it, and then you can delete the old staging. So normally when you start off, you probably won't do all these steps. You might start with a smaller subset of these. But the longer your project's going, the more it makes sense to automate this stuff. Um, so it's taking... Um, what might be a few days for a build guide to go and get this all right um, in a three to six month project is really, is time very well invested. Um, if you do all these things manually for a week, it's, it's okay. Second week, you get a bit sick of it. The third week, you get really sick of it and you'll start to make mistakes. So actually getting this stuff uh, fully automated um, really makes a lot of sense. So before I show you just a few um, sample scripts, one thing that people often ask about is web deploy. Um, and there's also a new sort of supercharged version of web deploy called the Windows Azure Accelerator for web roles. What that is, um, is a way of getting new code into an existing Windows Azure deployment without having to actually create everything from scratch and wait for the 15, 20 minutes. Um, it is a useful capability. Um, it's um, particularly for developers. So if you really, if you have a problem and things aren't working, you want to try new code and get code out there, um, it's really useful to be able to deploy that quickly. Um, Web Deploy has some really significant limitations in that um, it only works for one instance per role, um, which means you, you won't actually meet the uh, Windows Azure SLA. And then if your instances restart, you lose all your changes. The Windows Azure Accelerator for web roles does address uh, some of those limitations. Um, but even so, I would say that while it's a sort of a good feature for, um, for developers and maybe for some kinds of content management solutions, um, it's not really a part of the platform. Um, it installs extra code within your production VMs that I'll be a bit nervous about. Um, and ultimately, a 20-minute process out of the, a day of a development team is not a big deal. All sorts of processes take 20 minutes. As long as you plan your day and you know what happens when, it's not a big deal. So 
Um, I would say just go through a full deployment, know that you're starting from scratch, know you're doing everything predictably as part of your daily builds, and use features like web deploy if your developers need to diagnose problems or do some experimenting that is outside of that um, kind of daily, daily build process. Okay, so um, there won't be a test on this, so don't um, worry about reading the fine details, but I want to show you kind of an entry-level build process and how you might go about setting that up. So, as I mentioned, the um, MS Build is your friend here. Um, MS Build is, um, does a whole bunch of stuff out of the box and is uh, pretty easy to extend. Um, what I've done here is I've modified a .cc proj file. You can also create your own .targets file. It's the same code, different place. Um, so again, I'm not giving you a single prescriptive answer for how to do this because every build process is different. Um, but what I've got here, so I edited my CC proj file, which is my cloud project. Um, I have, um, I've got a laser pointer. So I've defined a couple of properties, but the main thing I've done here is I've created this new, uh, new target called Azure Deploy. And you'll see how I've made it depend on a target called Core Publish. Remember, Core Publish is a built-in target that calls CS Pack. Um, so by doing that, I'm basically forcing MS Build to run this target that it wasn't going to run previously anyway. So one, it will make it run, and secondly, it will make it run before my, other, uh, my, my new target runs. So MS Build, a lot of it's about sort of coercing it to run targets in a particular order because it's very hard to be very explicit. So using uh, depends on target makes a lot of sense. Um, what I'm doing here, you'll see I've got, I've got a bunch of variables and I'll, I'll show you where those variables came from in a minute. But the key thing here is I'm externalizing everything that's environment specific. So this is all really generic code. Um, and my actual target is just calling PowerShell. So I'm calling something called um, Azure Deploy.ps1. So really simple thing, but basically you can see it's Running a PowerShell script after it runs CSPack is really all I'm saying to do here and passing a whole bunch of parameters which, um, which are defined outside of this file. So the PowerShell bit, this is not a full file, this is just part of it. Um, there's two types of people in this world, people who can write PowerShell well and people who cannot. I'm in the latter category myself, um, so my approach was to steal someone else's PowerShell and make subtle changes to it. Worked really well for me, so I can uh, thoroughly recommend that approach. Um, but PowerShell is a bit wacky, it's really powerful, um, but you kind of got to have this sort of Unixy piping and redirecting everything mindset and um, my brain was not wired that way or I haven't done enough Unix in my time. Um, but if you can see here why we're using PowerShell and why we're not just trying to wire everything up with custom targets um, because there's some really quite complicated things with if tests and piping and things like that. You can see all these things, so get hosted service, new deployment, um, various uh, things which are part of the Windows Azure commandlet, so it looks very PowerShell-y. Um, you'll also see that I'm passing in a bunch of variables, dollar, uh, dollar service name, dollar storage account somewhere. So again, my PowerShell file has not got anything environment specific, so that makes it um, suitable for use with any environment that you want, which is again a really good thing, so you don't want to have to have duplicates of your logic um, just because you want to deploy to multiple environments. So for my really simple one, um, the way I've wired it all up is I've used TFS to create some build definitions. So you can see here I've got um, two different builds. I've got one called uh, deployed test and one called deploy prod. In this particular case, all I've done here is I've passed in these um, parameters just as MS build arguments. So you can see here I've sort of zoomed in what I've done. So all the things that are specific to each environment, so the subscription IDs, um, the certificates, all that kind of stuff, um, I've just stuck in here. Again, there's plenty of other ways you can do it. They include actually putting them in contained control of ACLs and stuff like that. But the key sort of takeaway here is to externalize and manage that information in a way so you can have multiple builds, possibly with different processes or different permissions associated with them that can then go to, um, to multiple environments. So with this stuff here, and I, I've got a, a blog post which I'll show at the end, um, in sort of half a day you can kind of have an entry level build and deployment process. And depending on what you're doing, um, could be whoever knows how long, but you do get a lot of flexibility through the combination of these targets and these uh, PowerShell commandlets to really make it do whatever you need. So a um, final sort of footnote, I guess, on, on build and deployment. So I mentioned before that developers will have the compute emulator running on their own machines, and that's where they do kind of their day-to-day -day work, and the compute emulator is actually pretty good. Um, so sometimes people say, look, can we have kind of a, an, an emulated central environment that we can do our testing on? Um, the answer is yes, you can, but no, you probably shouldn't. So um, a couple of reasons why you probably shouldn't. One is it's a bit of a pain, very fiddly to set up and not really supported. 
But the biggest reason why it shouldn't is that it doesn't actually prove very much. So because the emulator is not Windows Azure, it behaves very close but not identically to Windows Azure, the fact that it works on an emulated environment doesn't actually prove much. So doing your testing there is wasted effort because you have to do all the same testing by the time you deploy to the cloud. Um, people want to do it sometimes because it's quicker and you get more control and you can go and poke at it with a stick and see what happens and that's all goodness. Um, but again, for, as an environment for actual doing testing, not really a good idea. Um, that said, there are cases when people have done it and they probably had good arguments about why they said it was important. Um, if you want to do it, CSPAC has got um, a flag called slash copy only. The emulator, emulator doesn't use the CS package file. It uses a folder with a .csx extension with files in a particular layout. So that slash copy only creates that particular layout. Um, the CS run tool is basically the compute emulator and you have to bounce that every time you make changes, so stop and restart it, which you can do using uh, CS run. The other trick, um, which is probably the hardest one to solve, is um, there was a deliberate design decision that the compute emulator uh, is only accessible from on the local box, which is fine for developers. Um, but if you were to try to use a compute emulator as a test server, you probably want to have multiple people actually be able to access it. The way I've seen people solve this problem is by using tools, and there's a few um, open source type tools that do network port redirection, so it will map a public port to an internal only port. Um, so you can solve it that way. Um, but yeah, it's a bit, bit dodgy. Um, so now that I've told you how to do it, don't do it. Okay, so last topic about deployment. Um, so, so far we've been talking about compute, which is really how to get your virtual machines and your roles um, successfully built and deployed to the cloud. But a real life application is not just computer, it will also have data. So you might be using um, Windows as your storage, so tables, blobs, queues. Um, none of those things have a schema. So um, from a deployment perspective, that generally makes it easier, um, although it is sometimes a bit quirky because you might need to write initialization code to sort of set up whatever your reference data or whatever is. Um, but you sort of don't have this kind of extra step that you might, norm might be used to with a relational database to kind of get your schemas and sprocks and um, sort of reference data kind of set up as this dedicated step of your build process. Um, if you're using SQL Azure though, and in my experience most people end up using SQL Azure probably a lot more than storage, um, you basically have the same problem that you would have had for any other um, SQL Server project um, in that you have to manage these schemas, you have to deploy these schemas, and you also have to deal with what we call data motion. So um, if you're not deploying a brand new version from scratch, if you're updating an existing version of the application, you need to make sure that you can make whatever schema changes are needed without data loss which is a, a pretty hard problem as well. So conceptually, the problem is exactly the same as it is for, for um, SQL Server. The solution is basically the same as well, but unfortunately, some of the tools have not really caught up yet. So at the moment, there are a few areas of, of pain in terms of automating your SQL as your setup. But basically, the way that I suggest doing it is um, every developer should have um, a copy of SQL Server or SQL Express, doesn't really matter, on their machine. Um, just as you have an isolated development environment, um, for code um, inside Visual Studio and the compute emulator, you need to have an isolated environment for data so you can test stuff and not get in each other's way. And um, using SQL Server for that is, was no local version of SQL Azure, so SQL Server is basically your only option. Um, I'm a big fan of the, uh, what used to be called, or was never officially called, but commonly known as Data Dude, so the Visual Studio database projects that lets you integrate your, um, your schema files uh, with your um, build and source control uh, process. And indeed, you can, um, well, uh, most um, projects that I've seen have actually done the same thing for SQL Azure as well. The problem, though, is that um, even if you're really careful to write all your scripts in a SQL Azure friendly way, because there's a bunch of features that don't work in SQL Azure that do work in SQL Server, um, DataDude has this horrible tendency of scripting things out that are SQL Server specific and won't work with SQL Azure. So um, that said, there's a few tricks um, that you can do. So one thing is there are a couple of different types of um, data do projects. So there's sort of the classic ones. And there's this new thing called data tier applications or DACs, um, which are kind of the newfangled way of doing it. They have some particular limitations. So they're not for everybody, but they do support SQL Azure. So if you use, go the DAC approach, then uh, things tend to be a little bit easy for a SQL Azure project. If you don't go down that path, what you can do is deploy to SQL Server, um, and then you can go and generate SQL Azure scripts 
either from SQL Management Studio. There's an option to script things out in a SQL Azure friendly way. Um, so that would just basically modify deployed schemas to a different uh, format. Um, or if you want to mi uh, migrate a file, we'll actually migrate data. There is a Coplex tool called the SQL Azure Migration Wizard, which does a pretty good job. Uh, not perfect, I have found times when it crashes. So it's not a um, silver bullet, but it's a tool that probably most people use as part of their SQL Azure um, deployment processes. Um, as a last resort, and unfortunately I've had to do this myself, um, is you can strip out the things that um, are SQL Server specific and change them by hand. But again, you really don't want to have any hand modifications as part of your deployment process because it just leads to, to bugs and pains and suffering. Um, the difficulties here are really, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, so, so if you already have data in a database and you don't want to lose it, that becomes a data motion problem. Um, Datadu does um, a better job than most tools on helping you, um, helping you address that. So um, ultimately, there's, there's, there's no one-size-fits-all problem of making uh, schema changes. Sometimes it just is not possible for a system to know what the intent was. If you, change, if you add a new non-nullable column, for example, um, and don't want it to delete everything, how does it know what value needs to go into that? You need to tell it. So um, Datadu does a good job of detecting which changes are disruptive and preventing you from making those changes and giving you places to inject your own custom scripts. Um, and you can basically do that same kind of process, um, being careful that your scripts are SQL or Azure um, friendly. So at the end of this result, we should have some SQL scripts. The actual process of running those SQL scripts, um, SQL Azure actually is very compatible with SQL Server tools. So um, you can use osql.exe as a simple tool to, do, to actually deploy these against your cloud database. Um, there's also PowerShell, um, PowerShell sort of wrappers that you can do that to integrate with your build and deployment process. Um, when deploying to the cloud, keep in mind that at the moment, SQL Azure doesn't have a, a proper backup and restore capability. So particularly in that, that situation when we have a live version of the application data that we don't want to lose, even if you think you've got a really good data motion script, um, it, things could go horribly wrong. So there is a capability called create databases copy, which basically snapshots a database and creates a, 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 a clone of it within the same SQL as your data center. Um, it doesn't address a full set of, um, of backup and restore scenarios, but it is an extremely useful thing to put into your build and deployment process. So basically before you go and, and clobber your database with a script that hopefully works but may not, uh, create a copy of it, and then if things go horribly wrong, you can go and use that copy and rename it or copy back to our original database. So very, very useful capability right now. Okay, so that's the end of the build and deployment part. Let's talk just on a couple, um, a couple more topics, um, such as testing. So functional testing um, really doesn't need to be thought of particularly differently. Um, the only real question that people will often come out is where should I do my functional testing? And I kind of already addressed this before when I was talking about deploying to the compute emulator. So the nice thing about the cloud is it's really easy to provision as many environments as you want. Um, and every cloud environment is completely identical in terms of how it behaves unless you actually make it behave differently by putting in configuration that drastically changes things. So while you could deploy um, to an emulated environment, um, or an on-premises environment or whatever. Uh, the point about functional testing is ultimately to see whether you have bugs that will appear in the production version. So just do your, your functional testing in the cloud, uh, deploy every day, um, and you should, should be in a, in a good situation. Um, more mature teams will um, automate as much of their testing as possible, and that's absolutely true for Windows Azure um, projects as well. And there's no real reason why things need to be any different for a Windows Azure project as any other project. So um, automated tests, whether, they, whether they're against a UI or against service interfaces, are a thing of goodness. And as I alluded to before, um, it's a good idea to have a subset of these automated tests uh, done really as part of your deployment process. So you have an automated way of knowing um, but basically testing the most critical part of your application and seeing you know, basically, is this build good enough to test? Because you will have situations where something is so catastrophically wrong, you broke your configuration setting, that um, the, the build is not even testable. So putting a, a number of your automated tests that we call um, build verification or smoke tests um, into your deployment process is a really good idea. So 
by accessing the cloud. Does it say that somewhere? Uh, also, so um, if you're using a um, okay, yeah, if you're using a automated test framework, um, so usually that will like, that will run actually as part of a test running um, a test runner maybe in Visual Studio. So um, it's the tool I'm most familiar with is one called Watton, which is an open source um, UI kind of tool that basically lets you let, lets developers almost write UI tests. That runs inside Visual Studio, but that's pointed to the cloud. So the point is that that's running on your machine or a machine within your environment, um, but it's just pointing to HTTP URLs on the cloud. That's what that refers to. Yeah. Say again. Oh, a Watton, W-A-T-I-N. Um, there are a whole bunch of different um, UI test tools, including one built into Visual Studio, um, but Watton is very good um, sort of I would say professional UI testing tool that, that I've used in my terms. Okay, load testing is a slightly um, more interesting topic because, um, so load testing is something which is very useful to do for a whole range of applications, but it tends to be probably more interesting for Windows Azure applications because we tend to, the, the probably a big reason why we chose to target Windows Azure in the first place um, is because we want to scale to a really large number of users um, and quite possibly um, we have these sort of um, workloads that are, are on and off and we need to know how many servers we might need to support that. So it tends to be something which just because we talk about scalability and elasticity so often with Windows Azure it's a, um, a, a pretty interesting um, thing to talk about. So you can just go and probably load test the way that you might have previously, buy a load testing product, go and set up a bunch of agents um, running in your, in your local environment, point those at the cloud and have fun. So that's a completely viable thing to do. Um, but to generate a lot of load requires a lot of computers. And it tends to be a pain to go and find all those computers and rummage under desk, plugging them all in and all that kind of stuff. So, the re so just as using the cloud is great for production applications because we can get servers on demand and pay for them when we use them and turn them off when we don't, that same argument is actually really interesting for uh, load testing. So can we actually set up a load testing rig in the cloud? Um, the answer is yes, you can. Um, most load testing tools today were not designed for this environment, so it can be a little bit fiddly, but I have seen a number of people do it correctly. Um, so the question is, do you want to? So doing it in the cloud has a few advantages. So one, it may or may not be an advantage, but it's an interesting fact is you won't get latency. If you set your load testing rig to be in the same as your data center as your application, um, then it means you'll lose that latency. Obviously, real users will have latency, so you need to know what that is, but it's probably pretty predictable, so you can probably factor that in, um, sort of add it after the effect and understand what your data looks like. Um, so as I said, we can provision and scale on demand, so it'll probably save a lot of time and money doing it in the cloud. And you also won't pay for bandwidth. You don't pay for bandwidth within the Windows as your data center, um, whereas if you test it from the outside, uh, you will be um, paying for all that bandwidth, and load testing could actually be quite expensive. So that's another reason why it actually might be a really attractive proposition. On the other hand, if you test from your own environment, you get full control, you can use whatever products you want. Um, you get the latency, which again, you could argue is good or bad, but you probably pay for a bunch of bandwidth. Um, next question is what tools we want to use. So um, there are some people, I've seen a lot of people write their own load testing tools, spin up a bunch of threads, make a bunch of web requests. Not a great idea because it's hard to write good load testing tools. You might generate a bunch of load, but you probably won't know how much you generated and what really happened. So I would suggest uh, look at real, real load testing tools. Uh, Visual Studio 2010, um, Ultimate and Test Professional Editions have some really good load testing tools built in. Um, there are, of course, others, HP Mercury, others um, that are quite good as well. Most of them are architected in a similar way, um, but I would definitely suggest using uh, proper load testing tools for uh, an important application. Just a, a sort of a, a side note here, because I haven't had a lot of personal experience, but there um, is a, a new um, market for load testing as a service. So actual people, companies that build load testing tools that are in the cloud, that you don't buy and install, that you actually can go and configure through the web. Um, so Aster is one such company, there's possibly others. Um, so I, I haven't used them myself, but I know a few people that have that speak pretty highly of them. So you should definitely explore um, sort of cloud-based load testing as a, as a potential option. So um, I want to talk a bit about using Visual Studio um, load testing tools to test in the cloud because it can be done. Um, it wasn't designed for that purpose, so it is a bit fiddly. 
Um, but the, it, because it's, it's also a tool a lot of you are probably licensed to use already, it may actually be the most cost effective option to do this. So there's a few kind of key architectural decisions to make. Um, so the way that Visual Studio load testing works is you have the actual Visual Studio client, which you use to interact with everything. Then there is another box typically called a controller, and that kind of figures out how much load needs to be generated and who needs to do what. And it stores all of its information in a SQL Server database, not SQL Azure, but SQL Server. And the controller talks to a bunch of agents, and there's lots of those because they they're generating all the load, but the agents are pretty dumb and just do what the controller tells them. So you have to figure out what goes in the cloud and what doesn't. So the agents obviously have to be in the cloud or we're not doing a cloud load testing solution. Visual Studio needs to be in your environment. Um, so we've already got a hybrid application and we need to use Windows Azure Connect to make everything talk to each other. The controller and the database, you can do either way. So you can, if you put the controller in the cloud, um, then you've also got to put the database in the cloud, which is SQL Server that we all know is not supported, but it does work. Um, or does work until that box gets recycled, which may or may not happen while your load testing is running. Um, if you put your controller on premises, then you have um, high latency between the controller and the agents, and you might end up with a bit of data loss. So there are a few trade offs there, but both of them can actually work. Um, there are a few sort of things that are a bit painful around getting everything provisioned. So you have to um, script um, a lot of the setup, you have to get Windows Azure Connect configured. Um, you have to configure the local Windows firewall on both your internal boxes and your cloud boxes because the load testing rig uses a bunch of wacky ports. Um, and you also have to deal with uh, local user accounts. Uh, it's very easy to run this tool in a domain, but your cloud machines probably won't be running in a domain, um, in which case you have to actually set up a local user account with the same username and password on your cloud boxes and your local boxes. So across all this, um, it took me a couple of days to get this working, even after someone else has, had documented most of the steps. So that possibly just means I'm slow, but it just means it's also very finicky. But once it was working, it was very reliable, and I could actually um, generate quite a lot of load without having to have scavenged for workstations. So definitely worth considering, but be prepared for a little bit of, um, a little bit of heartache. So ultimately, this, was, this is the, the controller on-premise option. So again, it uses uh, Windows Azure Connect at that layer um, and requires various firewall ports open between those boxes. Um, but here we can just deploy, it's basically one role with as many instances as we want with the script on startup to automatically register that agent with the controller so the controller knows about them. So that is one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is putting the barrier here and putting the controller um, in the cloud, installing a local SQL Express in the cloud, which is not durable, but it will work for until that box gets recycled. Um, both approaches are documented on the web as well if you want to get some um, help in how to do this. Okay, um, last topic before we call it a night is let's just spend a little bit of time talking about operations um, because it is a, um, a critical, critical conversation to have. Uh, you need to have this um, sort of conversation about how is this application going to be managed before the day you push this thing through to production. So a lot of you have probably seen this slide already, but um, this is sort of explains, I guess, the differences between different cloud models and the over one of the overall value propositions for the cloud. And ultimately, it's about who manages what. So on the far left, you see an on-premises system where the company that owns this application ultimately has to manage everything from the networking and the equipment up to all the way to the application. On the far right, you get the software as a service model, which is someone else manages all of it, so no management costs at all for the customer, um, but you also don't get any flexibility. The SaaS software does what it does. If you like that, great. If you don't like it, then tough luck. So the infrastructure and the platform as a service offerings are kind of halfway in between where the, um, platform, where the infrastructure is managed by a cloud vendor, but you have some flexibility in what gets deployed. Windows Azure is the platform as a service offering, so that's a really good story from a manageability perspective because there's not very much that needs to be managed. Really, it, it just comes down to the application and its database. Um, but the way that that gets managed and the tools you need to use are probably not going to be the same. So um, making sure that, one, your operation team understands they still have a job to do, and secondly, that they actually plan how are they going to do this job so the application stays reliable. Um, because just because Windows Azure is running successfully, doesn't mean your application is running successfully. Maybe there's an application bug or a configuration setting or something. Um, so there may still be application specific things that need to be managed. So just a few kind of tools um, that will typically be used for, for operations. 
So as I mentioned, those lower levels of the stack um, are managed by Microsoft, but it is still really useful for um, a, a application management team, I guess, to have visibility in what's going on there. So it's highly available. The SLA is 99.95%, depending on what you're talking about. Um, but it is still possible um, that at certain times something might break. So knowing if there's any reported instances, inc incidents is critical and the, um, the Windows Azure Service Dashboard will tell you whether there's any known outages um, for any particular services in any particular environment. So just making sure your ops team uh, knows about that dashboard is pretty critical. In terms of managing the application itself, um, the best um, tool, at least from the Microsoft side today, um, is System Center Operation Manager. So that's the tool which hopefully a lot of, um, a lot of you uh, in, are using already, um, in that it provides sort of management capabilities across a wide range of applications. Um, there is a management pack that is specifically teaches SCOM how to interact with Windows Azure applications. So once you install the management pack, you go through a bunch of wizards, you tell it about, you give it your API certificate, you tell it about your, your applications and everything. And then it will have the ability of seeing your instances, seeing their health, viewing diagnostics data, viewing performance counters. You can set alerts saying if error 17 occurs, page this guy and get him out of bed. So all these standard kinds of things that you'll probably do for an on-premises application, you can configure SCOM to do that. Um, something I haven't got on this list, but is worth uh, noting, um, is we've announced something called um, System Center App Controller as an upcoming um, um, management solution, which will help with managing cloud applications, both public and private. So there will be some um, richer tools coming as well. But SCOM is a very good tool, and it's probably what a lot of operations teams are already familiar with. Um, there are also dedicated tools for managing Azure applications. So uh, a company called Cerebrata has a tool called uh, Diagnostics Manager. Um, I really like it because I'm not an ops guy, so I can't make head or tail out of SCOM. Uh, I can make head or tail out of, um, out of Diagnostics Manager. It draws pretty graphs and stuff, so I like that tool. Um, there's also a few things the applications teams need to do. So they need to firstly instrument their application, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but they also, it's also a really good idea to have um, synthetic transactions. So a code path that really goes as deep in your application as possible without causing any ill effects that can be executed um, automatically every five minutes or something. So you can actually tell, is the app actual application happy, not just is the web server alive and IIS running and all that kind of good stuff. Um, finally, I guess if you have um, DBAs, DBAs are possibly a little bit scared of SQL Azure because they can't do all the things they normally do for, for SQL Server. Um, and generally, it's actually good. They don't need to manage uh, some of the lower level things around file groups and, and whatever wacky things DBAs do. Um, so most things, um, at, but, yeah, a lot of things they just don't need to do. Um, it does have uh, dynamic management views, which you can interact with uh, SQL Management Studio. So a lot of those kinds of things you can actually still do uh, with SQL Azure quite happily. And a lot of the things around tuning with indexes and all that kind of stuff is really much the same as well. So just quick, quickly, from a diagnostics perspective, so I mentioned that um, developers need to instrument their applications. Um, and that normally means event logs and perf counters and stuff like that. Uh, one key thing to understand is that in general, you will not, um, like operations teams won't directly access those um, Windows Azure VMs. So there, Windows Azure Diagnostics provides a, a um, standard way for making diagnostic data available to the outside world. So the way it works is you'll write your application and it will just do normal Windowsy things. It will write to the event log, it will write to IIS logs, it will write to performance counters, and you can plug in trace listeners that can write to wherever you feel like as well. So it just does normal Windowsy things, and if you want, you can remote desktop into that application, and you can see those things using the normal way. So you can open up PerfBond, you can open up IIS, you can open up Event Viewer, and you can just see all this stuff in the normal way. And particularly as a developer, that's really useful. If you want to diagnose stuff and poke around and see what's going on, the ability to remote desktop into Azure is awesome. But from an operations perspective, um, yeah, great, you can do it, but it's, you don't want to have to sort of remote into every single, um, every single instance all the time just to see if it's happy and just to read its event viewers. You want a, a more scalable way of actually proactively figuring out what's going on. So what Windows Azure Diagnostic does fundamentally is gets all this stuff that's happening on that box and, on a, um, and the, the things that you nominate as interesting on a schedule that you choose, they get pulled into Windows Azure storage and every instance gets um, combined into Windows Azure storage. 
And from there, that's where all the tools run. So if you're a developer, you can point Visual Studio at storage and you can view that information. If you're an ops guy, then the SCOM uh, Azure management pack pulls that information out. Um, and that's actually what it uses to report and do all sorts of SCOM stuff. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of third party tools from um, Cerebrata and others um, that also interact directly on that. So the key message here, I guess, is there is a, a, a it is a really good uh, model, um, but you're not working real time. You can make it every 30 seconds if you want, or every minute, or every five minutes, um, but there is going to be a delay as that data gets pulled into storage. So just a few um, screenshots, probably a little bit hard to see, um, but yeah, SCOM is just SCOM. Um, ultimately, you manage it in much the same way you manage any other application, but you don't need to deal with your APIs or anything, it actually knows how to hook into those for you. Um, so that works really nicely. The Cerebrata tool is the one that I can understand. Um, it's a great, I, I use this while doing load testing to view performance counters in a way that lets me aggregate all my instances and show pretty graphs and stuff like that. So as a free trial of this tool, um, probably better for smaller organizations or non-ops people needing to wear an ops hat during development, for example. Um, but it is certainly a, an easier to approach tool, um, but not such a comprehensive um, end to end management tool. Just a couple last management things. So, um, Windows Azure portal uses um, Windows Live ID as its authentication mechanism. Um, when it first came out, you could only have one Live ID for the entire, um, for, every, for, for one application, which meant you had to share usernames and passwords, which was bloody awful. Um, now that's not the case. You can have multiple live IDs that um, belong to different people, so that solved the problem to a degree. Um, but the problem is that basically, once you have access to that account, as I mentioned before, you're all powerful. You can do whatever you want. You can delete stuff. You can scale up, scale down, do all sorts of stuff. For development and tests, that's probably really good. You want people to have that flexibility. But production and, and good operations processes are really about locking things down and only letting people do certain tasks um, at certain times. So at the moment, there's no way of actual, of, of, minima, of, of um, providing more fine-grained authorization within the Azure portal, nor is there a way of using anything that's not Windows Live ID. So what a lot of organizations um, do that lock this down is they basically set up their Live ID, which you need to have, give it a really strong username and password, and lock it in a cabinet and have a lion guard it so no one, no one gets that. And they'll actually not use the portal for any routine tasks. Um, instead, they will install management certificates. They will protect management certificates with Active Directory ACLs. And they'll grant different people access to different tools um, that just do the things that they want. So in production, um, that's uh, probably a much better approach than actually using the Windows Live ID um, uh, sort of, and the, the web-based management portal. So you might say, well, yeah, that's fine, but there's, um, I, I want people to be able to do all sorts of stuff. Um, I said that there are a lot of different tools um, that will do different things, and there's APIs so you can write your own tools. But I guess one example is this Windows Azure Platform Management Tool is basically an MMC version of the Azure portal. So it provides very much the same kind of view. So if you want to give people um, a pretty rich um, ability doing lots of things, um, but have it tied to their own um, Active Directory credentials um, via the management certificate, then there are, in fact, ways of doing that. So this is um, a, a free tool you can download. And again, you can write your own tools if you want to do other things. OK, last, last topic before we um, call it a night. Um, so a big part of operations and management for a Windows Azure application is, is making sure that you always have enough um, capacity to meet the demand of your application. As I said, we always talk about elasticity of being a really um, important capability that Windows Azure provides. And sometimes it surprises people to find out there's no magic checkbox, which is, please scale my application for me so I always have enough, um, um, enough machines. Um, the main reason we don't provide that checkbox is scaling is actually a, a really quite a complicated topic. Uh, not so much from an implementation perspective, but just from a requirements perspective. Um, so I was actually chatting to some of my old colleagues at Patterns and Practices today that are working on a, a, um, a, an application block for scaling. And they've got all sorts of crazy features because people want to say, well, normally I want to ha have sort of five instances except towards the end of the month when it's busy, I want to go up to 12. But also if I get lots of users, I also want to have more, more instances and scale down in quiet periods based on this particular KPI. So you might have sort of quite complicated rules. So probably the hardest thing about scaling is actually thinking through your requirements and thinking, what do I want this to do? What is sensible behavior for my application? 
once you figure out those sensible rules, um, it's actually not that difficult to, um, to write the code. So the Azure Management API lets you pretty easily change the number of instances. Um, ultimately, it becomes about where do we plug in that logic and what are the business rules surrounding that. If you have a, a simple time-based approach, um, you can basically write a console application um, and use the Windows as your scheduler, oh, sorry, the Windows scheduler on premises, for example, to just say, look, every, um, at nine o'clock, scale up to 10 instances, and at six o'clock, scale down to two, and do that every day, or whatever schedule you want. So a time base is actually pretty easy to get right. What gets more interesting is a resource-based one, which um, is where, depending on how many people are using the system and what they're doing, um, we actually want to scale the system up and down automatically. And that gets a bit tricky because you've got to figure out what do we want to measure and what are the upper and lower limits and how frequently do we want to check. So I mentioned that um, there's, um, there's well, the patterns and practices teams working on an application block for this. Um, there are a bunch of samples and blog posts um, or you could write your own. But all the approaches basically follow what I'm, this basic strategy that I'm showing you here. And it just depends on how many bells and whistles you want to add. Um, so suppose we have three instances of this particular web role. We instrument them um, with performance counters or use the default Windows performance counters depending on what we want to measure. Um, and we configure Windows as your diagnostics to regularly, say every five minutes, write all those performance counters to a Windows as your storage table. So that's just a built-in feature of Windows as your diagnostics, which is uh, just need to configure. You then write some code, which you probably want to put in a worker role, but it could be on-premises, it could be in a bunch of places. And it's responsible for reading that information out of the table and doing some analysis. So in this particular case, what I'm doing is I'm looking at a sliding window of those performance counter values, and I set a threshold. Say if the performance counter goes above this number, then I need more instances. If it goes below this threshold, I need fewer. And if it's in, in the Goldilocks um, range, it's just right, I don't need to do anything. So maybe every hour it wakes up, it checks historical data, and it says, ooh, looks like we're running a bit hot here. So it uses the Azure Service Management API, and it scales up that instance. So in this case, we need more instances, so it comes up with a new one. So you absolutely can write auto-scaling yourself, and for simple requirements, it's not hard. Um, but if you've got really complex requirements, you might want to look at a, an existing, um, existing solution from the web or wait for the Patterns and Practices version that will have a very kind of rich set of rules that you can leverage and minimize the amount of code you need to write there. So that's uh, basically what we were going through today. So just to summarize, um, we talked about which areas were kind of different and special for Windows Azure. So for build, um, it becomes a matter of, um, of compiling the code, configuring it for an environment and packaging it for the cloud. Deployment was really about taking that package and putting it in the cloud, doing all the song and dance that we might need to get everything in the right place and doing some kind of verification. Um, we talked about some different kinds of testing, so about functional testing and, um, and also about load testing and how we could do that in the cloud if we wish and some benefits and some, some quirks. And finally, we talked about various aspects of, of operations and how to think about that and what tools to use. So um, we've got probably a couple minutes for questions or I can hang around afterwards. Um, if you want to email me later, um, please, um, please do so. Uh, and I've also got some blog posts that talk about some of these concepts in a bit more detail as well. So particularly um, those snippets of build and deployment code, um, there's some much more detailed write-ups if you go to my blog there. So you don't need to go and memorize PowerShell today. So with that, um, thanks for coming. And I'll um, hopefully see you around at the party tonight. So have a good night. And do your emails. Any questions? So ultimately, um, yeah, so, so how, do you, how do you lock down access to the development testing environment? So look, as the Windows Azure doesn't know or care what environment's which, so the same way you can lock down a production environment, you can also lock down a development environment. Well, as I said, um, the, ultimately the Windows, is, the, the Windows Live ID is kind of the keys to the castle. That lets you set up management certificates, and the management certificates can then be secured um, in the Windows certificate store, and you can use different tools. So may, usually you'll have a lot more at stake in production, and you will suffer maybe some inconvenience um, for the sake of control and security. For development in particular, we probably don't have anything critical in there anyway. If someone did something stupid, it wouldn't be 